history does matter. Mm -hmm. People think, oh, that's the past, leave it in the past. Mm -hmm. But if we don't understand where we come from, we won't understand how we got to where we are. For many of us, this conjures up those images of the past, of struggling to be the best that you could possibly be, and at the same time, facing those glass ceilings. Oftentimes when people think about desegregation, they think that's black history. But it's, it's everyone's history. It's a history that tells us not only about our education system, but our political system, our social and cultural system. It touches on everything. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s brought seismic change to American society. Perhaps the greatest impact was felt in education. The U.S. Supreme Court's landmark decision of 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, ordered that racial segregation in schools gave unequal treatment to blacks and whites and was unconstitutional. The decision meant school systems would have to integrate. Virginia and other states fought back with massive resistance, but eventually relented and complied. In Henrico County, the process of school desegregation occurred gradually from 1963 to 1969. Anyone who tells you that the school desegregation process was smooth um, is either uninformed or lying. The sense is that we weren't Mississippi or we weren't Alabama or Arkansas for that matter. But the reality is that Virginia fought school desegregation as hard as any other southern state and that Virginians were committed to segregation as part of the, you know, the Jim Crow system, the Jim Crow era. Um, and so uh, I think it's important to recognize that um, African Americans bore the brunt of the school desegregation process. People hear the name Brown versus Board of Education, they're a little bit familiar with the decision and they think that Brown versus Board of Education led to school desegregation and that the process was fairly rapid and smooth and you know effective and so forth. But the reality is that Brown versus Board of Education does not lead to substantial school desegregation, that it's a long, hard fought process to integrate the schools throughout the South, including Virginia. And that process entails not just lawsuits and legal action, but protests and demonstrations and sending children into fairly, fairly hostile, formerly all white schools. Um, it's a very difficult process to desegregate the schools in Virginia. Uh, of course, for most African Americans, they're well aware of those difficulties and they're well aware of the costs that school desegregation wrought um, in the long run as well. We don't know a lot about Henrico. The memories have really been buried in a lot of ways. The archival material is difficult to find, and so it's the oral histories that help us understand what it was like. I think there was a culture in, in Henrico County schools at the time uh, that really uh, spoke very loudly to expectations that any, any challenges presented, Henrico County Schools could deal with them and was expected to deal with them. Uh, I know as a principal, I never even thought I had any choice. It was my responsibility to make things work and to uh, have success for young people. There wasn't a lot of time spent discussing whether we could make it work or not. The time was spent, how do you make it work? The Bible says, if a man needs your coat, give him your coat and the next garment as well. 
in many cases, we gave all we had to keep the tempo quiet so that there would not be this brain, this rising up. See, I told you that didn't belong in our school. See what they did? We kept the lid on. Whatever it took, we kept the lid on because we knew we were setting the example for all the people coming up behind us. And we didn't want that example to be the stereotype of black folks at that time. In Virginia during the segregation era, and now I'm talking basically from 1870 when our public schools were created all the way up until Brown versus Board of Education the years after, every locality had two school systems, at least. One for African Americans and one for whites. You have to combine those school systems into one school system. So the schools that are likely to be closed during the integration process are African American schools. The teachers that are likely to lose their jobs during the integration process are African American teachers. The administrators, principals and on down the line, are African American administrators. So there's a tremendous cost to the black community. For some students, that cost included losing a school where they felt comfortable, encouraged, and nurtured. A segregated system, even one with inherent deficiencies, was all they knew. We did things. We were supported. I remember the May Day things we did. I remember having my going to my first play in elementary school in a segregated situation, and it was Camelot. And I fell in love with plays in elementary school because there was there's a support there and people that loved us and cared about us and wanted us to succeed. And we were always told in order to succeed in America, you have to be three to four times better than any white kid out there because they don't believe you can learn. This was ingrained in us in a segregated situation. It was a comfortable environment at Henrika Central Elementary School. We felt like it was an extension of our family when we went to school. The teachers had our vested interests. They were pushing us to do the best that we could do in school. They didn't want us to settle for less. Um, they always pushed us to say, you can do better. You know, you can do better. Remember, Virginia Randolph was the only high school for minorities in 1963. Many of the uh, African-American students wanted to remain in the schools that they were comfortable in, the schools that were nurturing, the schools that their uh, um, teachers were uh, familiar with them, and in many cases, their parents and their grandparents. So there was a a level of security for those students in those schools that was really uh, difficult to replicate uh, if you move them out of that environment. I had a professor or teacher there who I will never ever forget. He was my math instructor. He would keep us after school. After he finished tutoring us, he would pile us all into his car and take us home. I will never forget a teacher like that who was so committed to education that he would spend that type of time with me and with other students as well. The crown jewel was Virginia Randolph. Now Virginia Randolph had an, an outstanding reputation for academic excellence, pride, uh, discipline, and and all of the things that you would uh, list as successes for school uh, and their leadership, uh, Mr. Bracey and, and a lot of the other folks that were at that school. There was a lot of success stories there that happened with a lot of kids there and, and the, the history, you know, like Virginia Randolph, you know, she was quite an educator in herself and, and look at the obstacles she overcome to be successful as she was to serve as many 
kids that she did. Students were comfortable in what was happening there. They were doing quite well, and, but it wasn't to be for the future. My father looked in 1954 and it said, Brown versus the Board of Education. He said, my child is not going to go across county because it's, she's now able to go to her local schools. At that time, I was only four years old, when he had already made up his mind to move forward on desegregation. There were meetings held during the time we were in elementary school, where in AACP and the parents would come together to discuss, is this a good thing or not? The arguments were, Bill, you rocking the boat. We got to let everything stand the way it is. And then someone else would say, no, we need to move forward. It is our right to have equal education. So those conversations started long before 63, 64. One of the things that put a little bit of ice on it was the fact in 1956, Henrico County opened four elementary schools one in each of the district, closed down all of the one and two room black only schools. So for the time I was first grade to seventh grade, we had a brand new school, but our books were never new. They were always falling apart, they were always written in, but we were in a brand new school. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 accelerated the change. School systems, particularly in the South, face the potential loss of federal funding if they fail to make sufficient progress toward desegregation. Many communities, including Henrico, adopted school choice policies to provide a path forward. In August 1965, Superintendent George Moody outlined a plan that divided Henrico into geographical, non-racial attendance zones. Parents could choose to enroll their children in their zone school or in the nearest formerly all-black school. At first, few black students elected to attend desegregated schools. In 1965, Henrico had 1,673 black students. Only 101 attended a desegregated school. A year later, the total jumped to 582. The numbers continued to grow in part because of the pioneering students who had already made the switch. A small group became the first to integrate Verina High in 1963. They came to call themselves the Eleven. During the 60s, you have to remember that prior to us attending Verina High School, there was a lot of cross burning that was being done by the KKK. Uh, for someone 14 years of age, that was very terrifying to me. Um, to see those crosses burn down on Dabatan Road, and then to know that these were gonna be some of the same students or individuals that you would be attending school, didn't know who they were, but you knew that they existed and you know someone was related to them. Was it terrifying uh, to attend school? Yes, it was. It was very scary. My brother, William Anderson, uh, was, he, my parents really didn't have to push him much because my brother, he had a vision and he wanted to, to go to the schools. He, he, would, he, was, he read a lot. He knew about, a lot about history. He followed a lot of the incidents in other states. And so he was ready for integration. And so when my parents said, um, we're going to send you to school at Verona High School, my brother was on board. Now, I was, wanted to go because my best friends were going to, actually. My parents wasn't sure I was strong enough at that time to go, but I wanted to go and I told my dad, I can do it, I can do it. We're kind of like isolated and we were kind of lonely. It was kind of a lonely experience a lot of times because we were in classrooms by ourselves. We didn't, a lot of times we didn't have anybody to talk to. Um, we didn't have, if we had a homework assignment, we didn't have anybody to discuss it with. 
many of the other, the white students didn't really talk to us. They didn't really, um, there were not a lot of conversations in, in, in a lot of the classes and activities. But there were some that were friendly and there were some that were encouraging. But many times we were pretty much on our own. What was the first day at Verina like? I have no clue. I pretty much erased that whole first year out of my memory bank. As we look at the campus, and you had to go around corners, wet, cold days, there would be many times there would be a line of people blocking your access, and you had to go into the mud because you weren't allowed on the sidewalk. You don't know how that demoralizes a person. And this almost brings up memories. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that I'd wiped out, but You know, sometimes I wanted to blame myself, you know, was it that I wasn't outgoing enough? But you gotta remember I was only 14. They would call you names, okay? I don't need to give you what those names were, but they, the, they weren't welcoming names, you know? So that's the type of experience that, um, that I remember. Um, and that causes me to choke up sometimes. But um, we survived. It was hard. And I, I, I will admit, there were some evenings and some nights when I came home. My brother was much stronger than I was, really. And I would cry. And my, I would cry because it was so hard the, the, having to do the classwork and then having to feel like socially kind of isolated. Many localities, and I don't know if Enrico falls into this group or not, but many localities in Virginia prohibited the first African-American students from participating in athletics, organizations and clubs, social events and so forth, in part to convince them to stay in the all black schools. You gave up so much. The extracurricular activities that you were involved in or hoped to be involved in with friends that you knew from the church and the community, that had all been obliterated. And now you're going into a school where you're not sure if they want you in those activities. You know they don't want you in the school. They're the ones who really lost so much. The athletic teams that they had known and come to admire were all changed. Um, many of the girls who had been cheerleaders in their own school couldn't get on the team in the new integrated schools. And so it was a, a major change, a very difficult, very difficult change. Life is full of pluses and minuses. Would I have wished the situation to have been different? Yes, but the reality of it is that was where we were, that's what we did in the time that we had at that place. Do I believe we left that place a better place? Yes, because during that time period, we were able to demonstrate that we had it all together. And that rather than saying, look how lazy they are, how this, that, and the other, oh, these young people can learn. They can excel. They can become our track stars. They can become our basketball stars. They just need an opportunity. And gradually chipping away at all of the stereotypes. As a coach, I got to know the kids. Uh, my first year, we didn't have any, any minority football players. I think 64, 65, we got, our first football player was Ronald Harris. He was our tailback. And Ronald was, was a big clown. He, he, he just loved to fool around, but he was an outstanding athlete. And uh, I, when I was head track coach, Ronald would run up and put his arms around me, arms around me and says, Dad, am I ready to do the long jump? And, and the kids would say, Is, are you his dad? I'd say, yes, I'm his dad. 
he would do that, I think, you know, to, to he's, he's that type of kid. You know, he, he'd hug you and, and, and he was that type of kid. I love my students, just simple as that. And uh, I, I had had very important relationship with all my students. I didn't care who they were. And uh, it was very, it was a great, great feeling for me to have these kids come to Verona High School and be part of the, of the student body and survive a very horrendous year for them. And uh, I'm so proud of them. And when I see them, I make sure I tell them that. And uh, I know they had a hard time. I can understand that. And uh, they're great people. We broke the glass for that. We broke the ice because we did we were academically qualified. We were smart. We were well-mannered. We worked hard. So getting rid of all of that stereotype helped on both sides. In 1967, under pressure from the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Henrico closed the first of its all-black schools Vanderval Elementary. The remaining four followed two years later. They were Virginia Randolph Elementary, Virginia Randolph High, Fair Oaks Elementary, and Henrico Central Elementary. Finally, 15 years after Brown versus Board of Education, Henrico's schools were desegregated. But challenges remained on the bus and in the halls and classrooms. Students had to adjust. Had to be tough for them. Had to be tough because uh, I'm sure some people didn't want them there. At the time, you were going through uncharted waters. The kids and and the administration, it was all uncharted, and they kids were just thrown in there. And, and I, th I think it worked out well, you know. At at the point that I remember, I wouldn't trade it for anything. High school was a was a great time. Just going to an all new place and not knowing anyone, but maybe three other people who came with you. Um, I, it would have been uh, very hard for me because Verona and the people I was in class with was my world. They paved the road for their, their younger siblings and peers. It's about all of us. It's about living together different experiences, different cultures need to come together, whether it's always comfortable or not, they need to come together to understand each other. And philosophically, uh, we always have felt that in our differences lie our strengths. And that's easily said, but you have to really work at it to make, make it happen. It wasn't easy, it was something that had to be both sides had to give, and, and a lot of times, in, in some cases, we, we didn't give, and, and we had to work with that, and we had some extremely difficult times, but over the period of time, I thought we did a pretty good job of, of getting it to work like it should work. One of the things that I would say about Henrico County is that opposition to school desegregation here wasn't as extreme as it was in many other areas of Virginia and certainly areas in the Deep South. Um, I would consider Henrico to be more of a, maybe a middle of the road county with regard to the school desegregation process and, and, and opposition to it. And one of the reasons for that is probably because Henrico had a relatively small number of African American students. In the mid 1960s when Henrico's going through the desegregation process starting in 1963, the county has about 30,000 students. About 28,000 of them are white students. And because the African American student population was relatively small, the thinking at the time was that they could be integrated into the white school population without posing a major transformation, uh, a major challenge. And um, I think that's important to remember. At Verina High, those trailblazing students persevered, drawing strength from each other. Through thick and thin, we have been friends. I hope it will remain this way.
for the rest of our lives, forever Jackie. Jackie, one of the first 11, is still my best friend. We were deprived of some things individually, but it made us stronger. If you look at the original 11, there are four that are deceased now, but if you look at the original 11 as a whole and how well we fared in society, how well we did in our careers, almost every one of us did very, very well, exceeded probably most people's expectations. We went on to be pioneers in other aspects of our lives. You know, so my brother, William Anderson, he went on to Virginia Tech and became one of the first blacks to integrate Virginia Tech. We each have a destiny uh, that we have to, and there's a calling on, and a plan for your life. And I am a believer who believes that that was my, that was God's calling for my life. Because in many ways, my experience at Verona High School prepared me for my career um, in later life. Somebody had to do it. And if my parents were, had invested that much in me and they felt I could do it, I was a spunky enough kid to say, yeah, I'll do it. Even in spite of some of the roadblocks that occurred along the way, I know what we did was worth it. I'm just wondering how far did the ripple go?